Welcome to the feedback on the two exercises we ask you to look at in order to help you confirm your understanding of the material we covered in Module 4. As with the other modules, feedback on the Module 4 extension exercises will be provided at the end of the course. In the first exercise, we ask you to identify the potential stakeholders for the domestic dwelling and, for each stakeholder or group, list the needs and requirements that may be elicited from them. Now here's a list of the people you might consider to be candidate stakeholders. There is you and your partner, your children, in-laws, friends, the bank, local government, neighbours, the architect and drafts persons, the builder and subcontractors, the tree that's inconveniently located in the front yard, and perhaps a couple of others, but let's look at each of these in a bit more detail by way of example. Well, of course, first and foremost, there's you and your partner. Assuming that you and your partner are joint mortgage holders, it's difficult to imagine that any other candidate stakeholder has as much right as you in any aspect of the system design. So it's your money, so you and your partner are clearly stakeholders, and you'll also be, of course, the major source of requirements. Your children. Now, your children are actually interesting as stakeholders. You'll certainly wish to take them into account, but they'll have rights that are significantly moderated by your desires and your budget. In other words, what they want will be something that will be important to you, but you'll change that in some way depending on what you can afford. Now, of course, in some cases, such as the right to choose the colour of the room, you'll give them limited stakeholder rights. But you're not likely to do that when they decide on whether or not to include a swimming pool as part of the overall system design. What about relatives? Well, you're also likely to give your relatives complete freedom over the design of your house. In fact, you may not wish to give them any um, consideration at all. But, perhaps, should an aged parent be occupying the house with you, you may give them similar rights, perhaps a few more, to you gave to the children with regard to the layout of their room. Of course, if a relative has contributed significantly to the purchase of the house, they may have the right to dictate requirements whether they live with you or not. Although, of course, if their donation was purely philanthropic, they may well waive that right. What about friends who may visit and may stay occasionally? Well, that, of course, depends on your relationship with them. But, like relatives, they have a similar priority. You'll take them into account, but they won't really be stakeholders. However, if they live next door, for example, as we've discussed earlier, you may decide to include a gate and a side fence so, they can, so that the two of you can move between houses more easily. What about the bank holding the mortgage? Well, the bank is a really good example of someone who, if we consider them to be stakeholders, we may get ourselves in a bit of trouble. Despite the fact that they've got significant power over you and the house, they're not really a stakeholder. It doesn't really give the bank the right to tell you everything about the house just because they gave you money. The money might come with some constraints, but it won't give them the right to tell you, for example, what colour the living room can be when you decide to paint it. So the bank does dictate the budgetary limit of your plan, which means that they clearly provide a number of constraints on your project, but they're not stakeholders, and you'll not engage with them really after you've been able to uh, uh, convince them of the design, be funded for the design, and met any of the constraints they might have for the milestones of payments throughout the payment of the original contract. Local government. Well, similarly, the local government regulations do place significant constraints on the house design, its location on the block, its access to utilities, the relationship you need to have with your neighbours, and so on. But that ability to impose those regulatory constraints makes them a major source of constraints, but it doesn't make them a stakeholder. For example, they can't tell you what colour the kitchen is. Their principal impact will be as a source of constraints in terms of where the building can be built, how you need to interface with your environment and so on, but that doesn't necessarily make them a stakeholder. Well, again, neighbours are constraints, not stakeholders. They may cause you difficulty in the building approval process if some aspect of the design comes close to their community rights, but the fact that they're a stakeholder in the community does not make them a stakeholder in your project. Their principal impact, if any, will be as a source of constraints. Now, of course, as we mentioned earlier, you may get on well with your neighbours and you may include some joint requirements in your building, such as shared parking facilities at the front of the house, access to each other's yards, and so on. But that's your choice, not theirs. You are the stakeholder, they are sources of constraints, and you may give them some stakeholder rights. The architect, draftspersons, builders, subcontractors... 
These people again have a significant interest in the success of the project because their reputation is going to suffer if the building falls down or even looks awful when it's built. This interest in the success of the project, however, doesn't make them a stakeholder. They can't tell you what your house should look like. That's ultimately your choice because you're paying them to work for you. Now, of course, we're not suggesting that you ignore them. You can't ignore them. Your relationship with them is very, very important. But their skill, their ability, their availability, their interest and their enthusiasm are constraints on the project. The tree. Well, the role played by the tree will depend on a number of factors. It's increasingly common these days to take into account the environment. It's a very important part of any design. How the tree is treated, though, depends. Perhaps there are council regulations that state that trees over a certain size can't be removed, in which case the location of the tree is a constraint on the building project. It can't be moved. The building has to be built around it. Otherwise, assuming that you're not constrained by such regulation, Perhaps it's up to you to decide what rights to give to the tree. If you are in favour of the tree, that is, you like the tree and it fits in well with the house, you may set as a constraint that the tree is not to be moved. If the tree is diseased, for example, or you can replace it with a much more suitable tree to the environment, then you may choose to cut it down and plant a better, a more useful tree in a more convenient location. In either case, the location of the tree is a constraint it can't be a stakeholder. That constraint is either going to be lifted or not lifted depending on whether it's controlled by regulations or by your desire as a business owner to protect or not protect the tree. Well, hopefully you've now a better feel about how to identify stakeholders in a project. In the second exercise, we ask you to examine the use of a simple requirements engineering tool, the functional flow block diagram. So for this second exercise, we ask you to draw the FFPD, which illustrates how a single businessman may utilise the domestic dwelling on an all morning when he gets up and goes to work. We ask you to start from when he wakes and end when he arrives at work. Now, of course, you'll have drawn quite significantly different diagrams, but they all have a very common feel. Rather than show you a finished one, let's take you through the process that we, how we might use the FFPD as a design tool to help us think about uh, how the system needs to support the activities that our owner needs to undertake. And that's the value of the FFBD. The purposes are to explore the way in which the system will work under a particular uh, example. And so effectively, what we're drawing here is a use case, and you'd expect to see these functional flow block diagrams as part of the operational concept. Now, by doing that, we're able to understand better the requirements for the system, and it'll give us some insight perhaps even to the feasibility of the system, it may even not be feasible to support these functions. So, in the example we're looking at, the single businessman utilises a domestic dwelling in, in terms of how he goes to work. Now, for these, we've assumed that a few activities have to occur as part of that process. We've assumed that he wakes and forms some form of ablution, that is, he cleans and grooms himself uh, prior to go to work. He has breakfast, presumably, some form of breakfast in, in some manner, which we can decide in more detail later. He needs to get ready for work by, by packing. He uh, needs to pack something to take to work, presumably through a briefcase, perhaps a change of clothes, some food for lunch, uh, at least some work to take back, a laptop and so on. And, and perhaps if he's a busy businessman, he may check his emails um, either uh, when he first wakes or before he goes to work, so he's got some uh, uh, work on his tablet as he goes uh, on the train or on the bus. Now this is our very first cut at the FFPD, and you can see here that we're talking about the major functions. So we've actually put them into a relatively, relatively uh, sequential flow. We've said that he uh, is asleep, he wakes up, he uh, performs ablutions, he has breakfast, he packs for work, he checks his emails, he exits the house, he goes to the garage, he gets in his car, he drives to work, and then he arrives at work. Now, in this first cut, which is our rough idea of how it works, some of the elements aren't quite as refined as they need to be, and some of them might even need to be uh, correct, because it's our first thought. So we need to test the flow to make sure that we're looking for the major functions to support the morning flow, and to make sure that it actually suits the, the, the businessman's purposes. However, you can see straight away, what if the businessman wakes up to a text message saying that he needs to check his email? In the functional flow block diagram we've developed here, it says that he can't do that until he's done a number of other activities. Well, that clearly is not realistic. He should be able to do whatever he wants in pretty well any order he likes as he prepares to go to work. 
We can accommodate these changes by simply restructuring the FFPD to recognise that there are four key activities that the businessman needs to conduct before he leaves the house, but these can be conducted in any order, and so we can draw them as parallel activities that he's able to conduct at his choice before he leaves the house. Now this is more useful, but still he has to do one of them in between waking up and exiting the house. Perhaps there's no time for him to do any of them. He just simply has to get up and race off to work because he's late for work. So here we've added a couple of new paths into the FFPD. Firstly, there has to be a null path, so he doesn't have to do any of those four activities. And then secondly, when he's finished one, he has to go back and finish the others, uh, or at least as many as he wants of those four activities, before he has to leave for work. Now as a result of this, we need to add then the ability for him to check the time available before he departs. And so you can see there's an activity there highlighted where he checks to see what time he's got and then chooses the task or tasks that he's able to do before he departs, does that task, if he has sufficient time he does another task, if he has sufficient time he does another task and so on. Uh, what that means is you can see that in a very trivial way here, we've identified that there is a need for the businessman to be able to know what time it is as he's preparing for work. Now, of course, we can do that any number of ways. We can insist that he wears his watch. We can place a large clock where he can readily see it and so on. But these are the physical solutions that we might apply later on. Here, we've just simply identified that the process will work much better if the businessman is aware of time as he's going through his morning routine. Now one benefit of using the FFPD is you can see the linkages between different activities to determine those requirements. So for example you can see that ablutions are likely to consist of a number of activities that then drive requirements for a bathroom, for a shower, perhaps a separate toilet facility in, in, in a domestic dwelling. For this iteration of the FFPD we've assumed that the ablutions consider of a shower and a toilet. And therefore you can see, just to show you as an illustration, how you can then take a single function and expand it into sub-functions to allow you to understand better how that process might continue. Now up to this point, we've focused on ensuring that the first half of the FFD flows correctly and reflects the functions of the system that's likely to be required to support the businessman as he goes to work. We, need to, we can then move on and let's have a look at the second half of the FFPD. We can also see then there are a couple of um, areas where the flow needs to be corrected. For example, there's no function whereby the dwelling or the garage is secured. We need to secure the house and then secure the garage before we depart. We can consider that to be perhaps a sub-function, but in either case we need to take into account. In more complex systems where major functions have many sub-functions, we can create individual FFBDs to explore the requirements and the functions at an, in a hierarchical way, as we saw when we went through this module. It's reasonable to assume that the businessman would always secure his house and his garage, and therefore they shouldn't be bypassed. However, it does highlight one oversight in the flow of the system. What if the businessman left his car parked outside for some reason? Perhaps the garage was full or it was, it was full of furniture in one stage? In that case, then, he would secure the house and then go to his car and drive to work. We wouldn't need that path through the diagram where he goes from the house to the garage to get into the car. So we need to include that additional flow, and it's shown here. At this point, then you can see, as the businessman leaves his house, he has a choice to either enter the garage, enter the car, secure the garage and drive off, or go to enter the car and drive to work. There are obviously other functions that could be considered as part of the drive to work function. So for example, um, if we go on uh, between driving and arriving to work in the flow here, the businessman might stop for petrol, stop for a paper, stop for coffee and so on. However, remember the purpose of the FFBD is to understand how the domestic dwelling works. And so once we get to the point where he's driving to work, it's unlikely that any of the things that follow will have an impact on the design of the dwelling. And so we'd probably simply stop at drive to work. From developing this FFVD, we now understand better some of the key functions of the dwelling during the morning. That is, we've concluded there must be a showering function, there must be a function to support the having a breakfast, and so on. It's reasonable to assume in this simple example that a lot of these things would have actually been considered even without the FFBD. However, what we've gained is an insight into the relationships between the functions, how one might flow from the other, and how things, how choice, for example, needs to be taken into account. This understanding may assist in making decisions about the locations of certain rooms or certain areas within the dwelling 
to allow efficient movement from one to the other. So while this example is relatively simple, hopefully you can see that in a more complex system, such as an aircraft or a very complicated building, the functional flow block diagrams are very useful in understanding how that system works. Well, we hope you enjoyed the week 4 exercises. If you'd like to investigate further, don't forget the week 4 extension exercise is available.